So, what's in this talk? Um, a few months ago, I was writing a Rust clone of the Unix utility Ministat that kind of does a simple statistical analysis on benchmark data. Kind of Here's two benchmarks. Was the result statistically significant? What are their means, medians, etc.? And I decided to go a little overboard and end up going kind of summation. So I wrote a little crate to do that and posted it on crates.io. Uh, so this talk will cover what Kahan summation is, why Kahan summation is useful, uh, then walk through building a bare bones implementation of a crate that does it, then adding progressively more polish until we end up with something roughly to what I posted online. So, to properly understand Kahn's summation and why it's necessary, you need to understand how computers store floating point numbers. The first thing you need to know about floating point numbers is that they are terrible. They have all sorts of unintuitive behaviors, especially when you get to the realm of infinities and not a number of values. But even with other cases, it's still bad. This is because uh, they have limitations. Uh, unfortunately, we are not doing computations on abstract machines capable of arbitrary precision. We actually have to store stuff in memory, and the operations have to be reasonably efficient using NAND gates and all that. So there are trade-offs. So uh, for anyone who is not too familiar already with how floating point numbers work, they work a lot like scientific notation. Uh, we have the floating point number stores the significant or mantissa, that's the 3.0779776, and it stores the exponent. Of course, this being a uh, computer, it stores it all in binary. And of course, we only have so much precision, so we had to lose some digits there. How much precision do we have? That depends on the type of the floating point value and what standard you're using. Rust uses uh, IEEE 754, which is the most common standard these days. Uh, technically, it also supports decimal floating point numbers. I don't know of anywhere that actually uses that. Um, Rust has two floating point types, F32 and F64. There's a chance that one day we'll also get F16 and F128. Um, there is a lot of complexity about floating point numbers I'm skipping over here. Like everything to do with not number, uh, the fact that there's positive and negative infinity values, the fact that minus zero is a thing you can care about. Uh, if you want to learn more, there is a paper, What Every Computer Scientist Should Know About Floating Point Numbers. That's probably a good place to start. So, let's talk about some of the uh, problems that floating point numbers have. Uh, because these store values in essentially binary, this means that a whole lot of fractions, even if they have finite representations in decimal, no longer have finite rep representations when represented in base 2. For instance, 1 tenth is 0 0.0001100110110. 11, etc. So at some point, you have to just draw a line and cut it off, which means we lose a bit of precision, and you end up with weird things, like if you add 1 tenth 10 times, you don't get 1. Uh, but you still have problems even when you get, when just dealing with integers. Because an F32 only has 24 bits of mantissa, once we start storing 2 to the 24, if we add 1 to it, well, we had to drop our 1's digit, so the 1 just gets lost. We can add 1 to it as many times as we want, and nothing will change. If we uh, go to 2 to the 25, all of a sudden we lose the 2's digit as well, then the 4 did, 4's digit, and so on. So this has consequences when you're adding together numbers of different orders of magnitude. If you add a large number to a small number, you necessarily lose some of the precision of the small number. Worse, if you keep adding numbers together, the uh, error grows. Proportionate 
but in the worst case, proportionate to the number of terms that you're adding up. For instance, 16,737,216, that's 2 to the 24, plus 1, plus 1, plus 1, plus 1, is still 16,777,216. But if you instead compute 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 16,777,216, you get 16,777,220. Uh, so we just lost associativity. Yeah, so floating point numbers are terrible. But Kahan summation is a way to manage these errors at the cost of making four times as many floating point operations. Uh, there are other techniques, um, I think pair, yeah, pairwise summation, uh, bounds the error to log n, but only takes, I think, twice as many uh, operations. So this is how Kahan summation works. Uh, in addition to tracking our sum, we also store in a separate variable the precision that we've lost. And then when we try to add the next term, we try to add in our error term to correct for it. How do we compute the error term? Well, we take our new sum, we subtract out the old sum, uh, or whichever was the larger of the two, but it's usually going to be your sum. Then we subtract out the term that we just tried to add, and the result algebraically should be zero, but because we're not doing pure algebra, it'll contain our error. Here's an example. Uh, to make things a bit simpler, it's all working in decimal, and I assume that we have four digits of precision. So we have 125,200. We want to add 973. Um, we don't have any error because we're just starting out. So we don't have to modify our term at all. We add them together. We get 126,173. But uh, because we can only store four digits of precision, we round that up to 126,200. Now we subtract away our original uh, sum and get 1,000. Subtract 973 from that, and we have our error term of 27. Okay, we decide to add 973 again. We subtract our error term, get 946. We add that to our running total, get 127,146. That rounds it down to 127,100. We subtract our for old sum, get 900. Subtract the term that we, the new term that we added after the modification, so that's 946. And our error is now minus 46. Um, and our expected value that we'd have would be 107. 127,146, error on the slide, uh, which is exactly what the error we expect from uh, our error term. So we are perfectly tracking the error here. What it would look like if we didn't do Kahn summation? Well, the first step is the same. We end up with 126,100, or 200. But then we add 973 again, and we round up again, and every time we add 973, we're going to round up again, adding another 27 error, until, well, how many times do you feel like adding it? Okay, so hopefully now you can ready, you have an understanding of how Kahan summation works, and might be able to implement it in Rust, because we're going to implement it in Rust. So first we're going to define a struct to store our running total and our error term. And for now, we're just going to hard code it to be F32s. Uh, Sanjay didn't cover it in his talk, but the derived statement up there 
basically tells Rust, um, create default implementations for debug, which means we have a debug rep pre representation of two string, which is useful for debugging, and clone, which means we can make copies of this. Uh, I deliberately did not make some or error public fields because there's no useful way for anyone to modify them. If you change error, you've just made things wrong. If you change some, you should be also setting error to zero. So there's no point. Uh, now we create an impl for our new struct. Uh, this basically gives our struct a bunch of methods. So we give it a default constructor new that just initializes the sum to zero. We have new with value that initializes it with the default value. Um, notably, Rust does not have uh, function overloading, so we can't have multiple functions with the same name but different type signatures. Then we just write to get our methods. Rust's inliner is very aggressive. So there is absolutely no cost. It'll, these will just get inlined out. Uh, so it's the same as read-only access to the fields. Uh, and we'll also add an add method that uh, takes our struct as a mutable reference. And uh, F32 is right hand side, and well, that's the implementation of Kahan sum there. We subtract off the error term, we add it to our new sum, we subtract off the old sum, subtract off the new uh, term, and update the variables. Um, we can make it slightly nicer by uh, checking whether right hand side or self.sum has a larger absolute value and swap them if it's the wrong way around, but I want to keep this simple. And here you see it's working. Um, it tracks the last term, we add one twice, and we end up with 12 million blah 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 and 18. So we have our struct, we can initialize it, access its values, we can add new items. So we're done, right? Well, it only works with F32. We have to make explicit function calls to add, which is kind of ugly. I guess you might be used to it if you're from Java world, but we can do better. And there's a really nice uh, method on iterator that will sum up uh, numbers if it's an iterator over you know, integers, floats, etc. So it'd be nice if we could have a Kahan sum method that does the same thing. So let's talk about thing, making things a bit nicer to use. Uh, we'll skip the problem of it being hard to F32 until much later. So let's talk about custom operators. Uh, as Sanjay Meth mentioned, uh, stuff like add and subtract and all that are implemented using traits in Rust. So if you want to custom add or subtract, you just implement the uh, add trait for it. And most of these traits also come in a uh, assigned flavor and a not assigned flavor. Um, one crucial difference between the two of them is that the assigning version takes a mutable reference while the non-assigning version takes the value by, it takes ownership. Which means that if you have ownership of it, you can get a mutable reference from that. But if you have a mutable reference, you can't steal ownership from the owner. It has to be given to you. This means that if you have uh, add assign, you can implement add in terms of add assign, but you can't go the other way around. So, uh, we'll just take the code from our add method earlier and drop it into add assign here. 
and nothing has changed, changed except for uh, the top line there. We do have to say use standard ops at a sign to bring the trait into scope. Uh, then we can just bring add it to scope and use it to implement use add a sign to implement it. Okay, so now let's try and uh, replace iterator sum. But before we cover how to do that, I'd like to go over a more general topic of adding new methods to a trait. Uh, Rust has a thing called the orphan rule, where if you want to add, implement a trait for a struct, you either need to own the struct, or you need to own the trait. That is, it has to be defined in the same module. Uh, the reason for this is so that you can't have two third-party libraries implement add for something in incompatible ways. Uh, but it does mean that if you create a new trait, you can implement it for a whole bunch of existing code already. Uh, so we don't own iterator and uh, so how do we add new stuff to it? Well, the answer is we create our new own trait uh, with the method we want, and then impull it for things. So I'm just say let's add a frog method to everything, and frog will just say frog, and we want to implement this for every Rust value. So we create a uh, trait, put our method signature in there, then we generically implement our trait for every single type in the language. Uh, you have to pull frog negator into the scope in your module for this to actually do anything, which means I can't create a, a stupid trait like this in my code and by my, in my library and have you pull it in and all of a sudden your methods get weird stupid traits. You have to opt in. Uh, but you can actually do really amazing things with this. And here it is working. So let's say we wanted instead our frog method to say the name of the value as well. Okay, so just print line, uh, have it print itself. And that doesn't work uh, because not all types implement display, which is what's necessary to uh, it should essentially implement two, two strike there. So how do we fix it? We add a type bound to our implementation. Instead of implementing for all t, we implement it only for t's, where t also implements the display trait. And now it works. It works for ants, it works for strings, it doesn't work for options, because options don't implement display. So if we want to add a sum method to iterators, we create a new trait, and then we implement it for all iterators, uh, where the iterator type value is F32. Um, and we just have yeah, a bit of functional, create a new kind of some fold over it, adding on. Um, and this works. We just added a new method to iterators. So if you have some iterator over F32s, you can now quickly compute a Kahan sum. If you instead want to manage keeping a running tool on your own, you can just add in new terms and it works how you'd expect. So, still only works with F32. It only works on F30, iterators of F32, but not references to F32. So, if you're doing this on a vector, for instance, you need to consume the vector, you can't just borrow it. Uh, 
And it also doesn't work on Box F32, RC, F32, or, or any of the other smart pointers. So let's fix that. Uh, first thing let's do is fix it so that it works on all float types, both F32 and F64. So we could just create additional impulsive stuff, but uh, instead I'm going to pull in the num traits crate. This is a third party crate that's part of the num crate family that implements a whole bunch of numerical types. The float trait is implemented for F32 and F64 and also implies a whole bunch of other nice traits like add, subtract, multiply, copy, partial equality, etc. that uh, float types implement. But it means we don't have to explicitly spell them out just because we want to use them. So, uh, our struct definition now has a type parameter, and that type has to be a float. Um, our initializer has to become a bit fancier, and um, in addition to the various traits, the float trait also has methods on for the constants 0 and 1. We need to use this because we can't just use the float literal anymore because we don't actually know that the thing implementing float is an F32 or F64, just that it behaves like one. So if somebody out there wrote uh, homebrew F128 and implemented float for it, this code will still work for it. Um, for the add and add assign, we just add the type parameters. Everything else is exactly the same. When it comes to our summation trait, uh, things get a little trickier. We have to have two type bounds for the implementation. One to say, okay, uh, we have to, that our type has to be an iterator, and then another to say that the type that's iterating over has to be float. Uh, but that's still, we still need an owned F32 or F64, whatever type. We can't work over references yet. And we could just create multiple implementations of that, just copy and paste the code. Uh, so our item is iterator of T or iterator of reference to T, etc. Or we can use one of the fancier types in the system, which is the borrow trait. Um, if T implements borrow U, then if I have a T, I can get a U reference. And just have abstracts over all the different ways that you can get a reference to a type. So there's implementations so that you can get to stir reference from a string, path reference from a path buff, etc. But it also gives us all these. So if you have a reference to a type, obviously you can, can give you a reference. It can remove the mute from a reference. It can, if you have an own value, it can give you a reference to it. It will give you references from all sorts of all types of smart pointers, from a copy on write. So this is perfect for our needs. Okay, so we just update our type uh, bound there. So now we want to implement this for an iterator over type of items of type V, where V is implements borrow over type T, where T is a float. So it's uh, tricky. Uh, the other change that we had to make is call item.borrow to get the reference, and then immediately turn around and dereference it. Uh, and finally, a few nice things to implement. If you have a nullary constructor, it is really nice to just implement a default for it. Uh, default is just a trait that says, call default and I'll give you a 
basic default value. Um, and then if you have a nullary constructor like new there, just implement it in terms of default. And uh, yeah, that's my talk. Um, I didn't cover writing tests. I didn't cover writing documentation. Those are both very important, but also both really big topics. And I didn't cover how to actually publish on Crates.io because it would basically just be me cribbing the documentation because I've already done it twice before. I'm sure that the next time I'm going to do it, I'm going to be reading the exact same documentation you did. So, uh, yes.